Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you today. Hope you've had a pleasant weekend thus far. We have a beautiful day in southeast Texas. It is good to be here in the presence of one another, in the presence of the Lord, to study the Word of God. We're continuing our study today in the book of Hebrews, and we're in chapter 10, finishing that, and we'll be moving into chapter 11. We have divided the book of Hebrews into three major sections. The first section, which encompasses a little more than seven chapters, uh, speaks of the superiority of Jesus. The second section, which you'll see on the slide behind me, the superiority of the new covenant. And now we come to encouragement based upon the superiority of Jesus and his new covenant. And the section that we're looking at right now is in chapter 10, verses 19 to the end of the chapter. And it's a chapter that is designed to give us encouragement to follow through, to carry on, and to do the will of God. We're going to read the last part of that. We covered the first part of that on Wednesday evening. We'll read the last part of that this morning, and then we'll move right into the study. Let's pray this morning. Our Father and our God in heaven, we humble ourselves before you today, thanking you, Lord, for this time that we have to study from your word. God, you have blessed us so richly in so many ways. And we are truly grateful. We thank you, Father, for the measure of health that we have, this good land that we live upon, and for your good word, which instructs us in how we ought to live. May we serve the Lord Jesus faithfully this day and every day of our lives. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen. All right, as we look here at Hebrews chapter 10, we studied the first section, which we saw several one another passages. Remember, uh, we saw... Uh, Verse 24 and 25, this is where we left off last time. Not forsaking the, I'm sorry, verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That phrase, one another, is and each other, put those two together, they're found about a hundred times in the New Testament talking about our relationship with one another, with one another. Sometimes we look at the Bible and think merely in terms of our relationship with God, and that's clearly important. It is the primary relationship, but we have a secondary relationship that is also important, and that is our relationship with one another. Uh, As a Christian, our relationships can be described as vertical and horizontal, Vertical in that we have a relationship to God. Here on earth, we have a relationship to God. But we also have a relationship with one another. That's the horizontal. So we have vertical and horizontal both. Now, as the apostle is encouraging them, he's encouraging them to be faithful to God because they were tempted. Remember the Hebrew Christians were tempted to go back to the law of Moses. And they must not do that. Doing that, they're forsaking everything that they have in Christ. And in verse number 26 of this chapter, down to the end, we're going to read this. Verse 26, it talks about those who go on sinning after they become Christians or those who go on sinning willfully. While none of us have reached the state of sinless perfection, if you, have, if you believe that you have reached a state of sinless perfection, you're probably wrong about other things too because no one in this life reaches a state of sinless perfection. We will stumble in one way or another, but we have Christ as our advocate who provides forgiveness for us. But when you look at the text here, for the person, someone says, well, since I can't reach sinless perfection, then it makes no difference how I live my life. That's completely wrong. Uh, is there anyone here who is a perfect driver, and in all your years of driving, you've never crossed over the yellow line by accident or never made uh, a bad move while you were driving? Anyone? <laughs> Trudy says, <laughs> Trudy, you're, you're qu- making me question your veracity. No, there's no such thing as a person who is a perfect driver. We all make mistakes sooner or later. While many of us, not me, but many of us might escape receiving a traffic citation, we're still not perfect. 
and we make a number of mistakes. Uh, we fail to stop at a stop sign. We may slow down and do a rolling right turn and so on. Just because you can't be a perfect driver, does that mean then that it doesn't make any difference what you do when you're driving? You might as well take your hands off the wheel and just let happen whatever will happen. You wouldn't do that in driving, but that's what some people think is true about Christianity. Since you can't live a sinlessly perfect life, then it really doesn't make any difference what you do. And that's just completely false, brethren. That's completely false. If it makes no difference what you do, then why would you have all these warnings? The book of Hebrews has a series of about six or eight warnings that it tells us to be on guard, be watchful, be careful. And so that's what we should be. But there are some people who say, well, I want nothing more to do with Jesus. And they then will reject him and they will go deeper and deeper into sin, even though they may have once been Christians. And that really is what you've got here in verse 26. And he gives the warning here in verse 26. And I'm going to read 26 down through 31 for the moment. 26 to 31 of Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trodden the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So here's a stern warning against rejecting the gospel. The sinning willfully, I think, is described in verse number 29. You know, people often ask, you know, is there such a thing as the unpardonable or unforgivable sin? Well, the only one that Jesus spoke of was in Matthew chapter 12 when he talked about the person who blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And yet a lot of people don't even understand what that is. Uh, if there is an unforgivable sin, and I think there's some sin that cannot be forgiven, not because God will not forgive, but because of the condition of heart that we have. Whenever there, there's a sin that will not be forgiven, it's always because of our heart. It's not because God says, oh, I'm so mad, I will never forgive you. That's not the disposition of God. But when a person has a heart that has rejected God, rejected Jesus, rejected the Holy Spirit, rejected the Bible, and refuses to be touched by anything that God has, they've committed an unpardonable sin. It cannot be forgiven. Why not? Well, because of the condition of their heart. And here in this text, in verse number 29, you'll see who he's talking about. He says, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has done what? One, trampled the Son of God underfoot. It's like knocking Jesus out of the way and stepping on him as you go past. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. Blood of Jesus means nothing to this person. Nothing. And then finally, having insulted the Spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, rejecting this word. And so if you, get, if you get in a condition where you are like that, what's going to change you? If you have such a complete, utter, total, and final rejection of Jesus and the Word of God and all that God has done for you, what's God going to do to reach you? Somebody tell me. There is no way of reaching you. You have put yourself by a heart condition outside of the will of God where you cannot be touched. And it's a problem, again, not with God. The problem always rests with us when you come to something like that. Now, obviously, in verse number 29, he was contrasting this with the person who rejected the law of Moses. Someone who rejected the law of Moses under the Old Testament would die, verse 28, without mercy 
on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so that's how it was under Moses' law. Now he says of how much worse punishment will it be for the one who rejects Christ. And so I hope you understand there that this is not, the idea of sinning willfully here is not the idea that, oh, I've done something wrong and now God will never forgive me. The sinning willfully is described here. It's a willful rejection of Jesus. And that person has nothing to expect except judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversary. Uh, I've got some questions on page 15. And I guess the, we've already answered the questions, but we'll still touch on it anyway. We've answered all the questions down to number six. Number seven what is the state of the person who goes right on sinning after having received the knowledge of the truth? What remains for him? Judgment. And there is no other sacrifice. It said there remains no more sacrifice for sin. God doesn't have a plan of salvation, number two. It's not like, okay, on the judgment day, for all those who rejected Jesus, who rejected the gospel, who turned away from the Lord and his plan, here's a second plan now that maybe will get you to heaven. No, sir, it doesn't exist. There is no plan of salvation number two. So there's nothing good that remains for this person. And by the way, I've had over the course of the years that I've been preaching now, 46 years, occasionally I will have someone come up to me and say, you know, Brother Max, I'm just worried that I've committed an unpardonable sin. No, you haven't. Not if you're worried about it, <laughs> because the person who's committed such a sin doesn't worry about it. The only sin that God will not forgive is the sin that we refuse to repent of. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, John speaks of the sin unto death. All other sin can be forgiven, but the sin that I refuse to repent of will not be forgiven. I remember many years ago when I was still living in Indiana, a lady in a church up there, it wasn't where, where I worship, but it wasn't far from, uh, her son was in prison for, for life for having committed a murder. And she asked me if I would go with her to visit him in prison and try to talk to him. And of course, he was in the state, state penitentiary at Pendleton, Indiana. And uh, I picked the lady up. She was an elderly woman. And we went over there together. And she said, you know, my son committed a murder. It was involved in a robbery. He and another fellow were robbing a, a gas station. And uh, my sh son shot the attendant and killed him. And it's too bad, you know, because she said, murder is an unforgivable sin. Well, then my question was, why are we going over there to see your son to try to talk to him about the gospel if murder is an unforgivable sin? Murder can be forgiven. Any sin can be forgiven if we will repent of it. That's the critical factor to take note of, okay? And someone says, well, what about Matthew 12 when it said, the one who blasphemes the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about a heart condition. And the reason that would not be forgiven is that that person's heart would not be touched by the gospel. Uh, what happened when a man despised Moses' law? What was to happen to him? Bottom question on page number 15. Died without mercy. And so the person who rejects Jesus is in worse circumstance than that. Question 9 at the next page, page 16. What is the consequence when a man then despises Christ? Cut off, from Cut off from salvation. He has nothing waiting for him except a certain fearful expectation of judgment. Now, I will have to tell you, folks, if you come in contact with the once saved, always saved people, how, how are they going to deal with this text? Because this is talking about someone who has received the knowledge of the truth. Remember verse 26. But now they have rejected the truth after having received it. So they believed the gospel and obeyed the gospel. What happens? What happens to that person? That person is lost because he's despised Christ. How would the once saved, always saved people answer this? Well, there you go, brother. Never saved in the first place. However, the text says they received the knowledge of the truth. And verse number 29 
says this person was sanctified by the blood of Christ. How do you get more saved than that? Sanctified, made holy, clean by the blood of Christ. And so the once saved, always saved people, they give that as their standard answer. Well, that just means you were never saved in the first place. And it just doesn't work, folks. It just does not work. Don't ever accept this idea of once saved, always saved. It is a very popular doctrine. You know, it used to be that you had only one or two groups maybe that accepted this idea of once saved, always saved. But it's believed now almost across the spectrum that, you know, we become, uh, we live in an age of toleration where anything goes, and it's, so it's sort of got to the point, gotten to the point where, okay, well, whatever you believe, whatever you do, God's still going to save you. I mean, you'd have to, it, well, if God saved you, that's it. Case closed. And it's just not true. It is a false doctrine. Uh, I, I ask you question number 10, and we've already answered that. Are these warnings given to Christians or to those who have never followed Christ? Obviously, it's given to Christians. Verse 26, those who receive the knowledge of the truth. Verse number 29, those who have been sanctified by the blood of Christ. That meant they had been cleansed. So, question 11, what do these warnings do to the doctrine of once saved, always saved? I put down three words. I don't know what you wrote. I put down obliterate, devastate, and annihilate. Okay? Dumps in the garbage, in the garbage he said. Okay. <laughs> you see the idea. Anyone got a question about that? You know, the, there's... A lot of people run across verses and say, well, I think this verse says that once we're saved, we're always saved. Remember the first rule of Bible study, the first law of Bible study is what is called the law of harmony. You cannot have one verse contradict another. And so when we see plain statements like this about the condition of a man who turns away from Jesus, you're not going to find a verse in another place. You're not going to find a verse in another place which says this man is still right with God. Uh, let me give you just one verse. I'm going over to John 10. You want to slip over there with me in John chapter 10? Let me give you a verse and see what you would do with this. This is John 10, 27. And Jesus is talking about his sheep here. John 10, 27 and 28. And this is a verse which is one of the prime, it's called a sugar stick, okay? Okay. A sugar stick is when the false teacher's got his favorite verse he's always going to bring up, okay? And this is a sugar stick for the once saved, always saved. And they think this verse cannot be answered. It teaches once saved, always saved, case closed. There's no answer for it. But let's read it. In verse 27 and 28, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Notice Jesus said in verse 28, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. So, so just as soon as someone has become one of the sheep of Jesus, they can never perish because Jesus has given them eternal life. That's the argument that is made on this text. Now, what would you say about that? What would you say? Larry? It said what? They that follow me. Yeah, see, what this verse is about is about the, the faithful child of God who is following, who is following Jesus. In fact, more than half of the verses that people will offer in favor of once saved, always saved, are verses that are talking about the faithful. Who has a question about the faithful? Nobody. It's about the unfaithful. What you need is a verse that says, even though they quit following me, I will still give them eternal life and they will never perish. If you notice carefully, we read 27, my sheep hear my voice, they listen to Jesus, and I know them, and they follow me. So they hear Jesus, and they follow Jesus. These are the ones to whom the Lord gives eternal life. These are the ones who will never perish. 
And you can just look at the list of all the passages, and they offer about, I don't know, 15 or 20 passages that once saved, always saved, says, see, this proves our doctrine. But in nearly all those verses, it's talking about someone who's faithful, not someone who is unfaithful. What they need is a verse that says, those who quit believing in Jesus, those who quit following Jesus, they will receive eternal life. You don't find that. Remember Hebrews 3.12? We saw this uh, several weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. The writer said, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's speaking to brethren here. Be, beware, brethren. This is talking about Christians. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, what it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Notice it speaks of someone who departs from the living God. And I'm going to borrow Roger's answer again. Someone says, well, this person never was saved in the first place. How can you depart from God if you were never saved in the first place? This speaks of someone who's departing from God. It's like, uh, you know, in about two hours from now, we will be departing from this building. Someone says, well, if you departed, that proves you were never there. What? That's the kind of absurd reasoning that you will often find in those who teach once saved, always saved. Don't be drawn in by that faulty doctrine. Let's be faithful to God. The faithful, no question about their salvation. Anybody got a question on that before we move to the rest of our text in Hebrews 10? Tommy. Yes, and, and that's, uh, that's John chapter 10, verse 29. Another verse which they also use, which Jesus, uh, in the end of verse 28, he said, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so Jesus says they're in my hand, and they're in the Father's hand. And so they're kind of like double protected, Okay. The idea of snatching them out of his hand. Can the devil snatch you out of God's hand? Can the devil snatch you out of the hand of Jesus? No. Jesus said no. It's the faithful who hear his voice and who follow him. They're the ones who will not be snatched out of his hand. But I will tell you what you can do. You cannot be snatched out of God's hand as long as you hear the gospel and follow Jesus. But you can leave. You can walk away. And that's the problem. You see, again, this is a promise made to the faithful who hears the voice of Jesus, who follows Jesus. It's not talking about the person who quits following Jesus. Uh, there, there was a tract written several years ago by a leading proponent of once saved, always saved. Uh, the man's name was Sam. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, cor that's incorrect. Uh, I'm, I'm getting his name mixed up with someone else, so I will... I will, not, uh, I will not mention, I'll not try to mention his name because I think I'm, I don't want to mis, misattribute a quote. But the man said that once you're saved, all the Bibles you may read will not make you more saved. And all the prayers you may pray will not make you more saved. And all the church services you may attend will not make you more saved. In fact, nothing you do from the moment you're saved, nothing you do for the rest of your life will have any bearing at all on your salvation. You may lie, cheat, steal, blaspheme, spit on the Bible, and you still go to heaven because Jesus saved you and you cannot be snatched out of the hand of Jesus. You're there and you can't, you couldn't go to hell if you wanted to now. That's how extreme it is. And someone says, Oh, I can't believe that. I'll produce that track for you if you'd like. And it's not an, un, it's not an uncommon track. It's by one of the leading proponents of that doctrine. Yes, Curtis.
Yes, there are sheep that do go astray who will not be found, and that's because they refuse to be found. Uh, I saw a hand over here, I thought. Yes, Brother Buckley. Brother Buckley is pointing out that in the doctrine of millennialism, there is, in some forms of that, a second chance offered for salvation, where during this millennial period, this great tribulation, which is the early part of the millennial period or just precedes it, that there's a chance to be saved, but it will involve the shedding of your own blood. Uh, folks, there is no future there is no future plan of salvation for anyone. Yes, Jerry. Yeah. In Revelation chapter 3 and also Revelation 22, it talks about names being blotted out of the book of life. And so that answers the question. Well, let's finish the chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and continuing on at uh, verse number 32. Now, he, he suddenly shifts gears right in the middle of this, and he talks about how these people had suffered for their faith after they became Christians. And I think what he's saying here is, look, don't turn away from Jesus because here's the consequence, it's bad. But remember what you've already endured for him. And so what you've already endured for him, you must continue to do that. Beginning at verse number 32, he says, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And what he's, he's talking about is these, some of these were Christians, may have become Christians as far back as the day of Pentecost. Some of these Hebrew Christians, they may have been Christians now for maybe even 30 years. And now they're facing all this trouble, all this persecution which has come upon them. And he reminds them that they were persecuted in the beginning when he mentions in verse 32, the former days in which after you were illuminated, illuminated is talking about when they first became Christians. He said, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. In the book of Acts, do you remember in Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, when the persecution began against the church, not just against the apostles, but in Acts chapter 6, Stephen, one of the seven men who served tables in Jerusalem at the, at the church, uh, uh, evidently a deacon, this man was engaged in a controversy with some of the Jews. In chapter 7, he made his defense. At the end of chapter 7, these Jews wound up killing him. And what did this lead to? Chapter 8. They were all, the disciples were all forced to leave the city of Jerusalem with the exception of the apostles. And of course, they went everywhere preaching the word. But these lost, these people, these Christians lost so much. They lost their homes. They lost their jobs. And so he talks in verse number 32 about a great struggle with sufferings. And in verse 33, he continues that partly while 
you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. People were trying to put you to shame. They gave you all this trouble. And, and you endured all these things. And you also became companions of those who were so treated. So it wasn't just you, it was others. And you were sympathetic toward others who had these problems. Verse 34, you had compassion on me and my chains. This sure sounds like the Apostle Paul here. If Paul is the writer of Hebrews, this would certainly give evidence in that regard. You had compassion on me and my chains, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. People would come into their houses and just take their stuff. And they had no recourse, none. No way of saying, hey, this is wrong what you're doing. I'm going to have you arrested. Who's going to arrest you when the police were on the side of the crooks? And so you, you see the difficulty here, the plundering of your goods. Why were they willing to endure this? For what reason did they, were they willing to endure all this trouble, suffering, tribulation, losing everything they had? Why were they willing to do that? For salvation. Notice the end of verse 34. Knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. What you have in heaven is better than anything you have on this earth. Do you believe that? It's a nice theory, and do we really believe it? I hope we believe it, because heaven will be worth it all. You have a better and an enduring possession. What about our possessions on this earth? Are they enduring? No matter what you've got, it's all going to be gone someday. It doesn't last forever. But in heaven, we have an enduring possession for, he says, who? For yourselves in heaven. This belongs to Christians. And it's not here on this earth. It is in heaven. By the way, Brother Ben and I, tonight, we're going to do a tandem study entitled A Conversation About Heaven. We're just going to be talking about heaven in very broad terms about some things that we need to know and appreciate about heaven. So he says in 35, don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. God is, if, if you give up your faith, you're, you're giving up all that God has been providing for you. And notice I ask you a question, question 12 on page 16. In verses 32 to 37, he asked them to recall the former days. Why? And what had happened? Why was it important to remember these things now? Why should they remember these things now? Because that's what he's asking them to do. I want you to remember these earlier days when you had all this trouble. Why remember that now? Trudy? Yeah, because now they're tempted to turn back, and you've already endured so much. You don't want to make this all for nothing. And so you need to continue on. In those days, they were willing to endure so much, and now they're tempted to turn back. And they must not turn back. And uh, there, there are a couple of things to note here. First of all, look at verse 36. You have need of endurance so that you, after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And so it's the, it's the promise of salvation. Now, for some of these Christians at this point in time, these Hebrew Christians... It was a promise of relief from the persecution because the persecution was intense. And who was persecuting the Christians at this time? It was the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and their network that they controlled uh, throughout much of the Roman Empire. It was the Jewish leaders. And the Jewish system was about to be brought down. Remember Matthew chapter 24 Jesus talked about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the disassembling of the temple, the end of the sacrifices. All of that would happen when? When the Romans came in 70 A.D. and they overthrew the city. And that would serve as a judgment of God upon the Jews. And so verse 37 says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And here, I think he's talking about the Lord coming in judgment against the city of Jerusalem. He says it's a little while off, but he is coming and he will not delay. We believe the book of Hebrews is written in about 63 or 64 A.D. And so in about seven years from the time this book was written, Jerusalem was overthrown and the Jewish persecution 
for the most part, came to an end at that time. Now, he says in verse 38, the just shall live by faith. That is, we continue on, and we will, we will, uh, we will receive salvation. We shall live by means of our faith. But if anyone draws back, and here's this idea of departing from Jesus again, going back to the old law even, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Matthew chapter 24, in talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus said, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And so there the idea of being faithful to God, even in the midst of persecution, and God would indeed bless you in the after a while. Uh, Question 13 on page 16, our last question for this section. Though the writer has given a stern warning, he makes it clear in verses 38 and 39 that he doesn't believe the worst about these Hebrew Christians. He has confidence in them. He has confidence in them. And I ask you to also look at Hebrews 6, 9 and how we should regard warnings given to us today. In chapter 6, in the opening eight verses of that chapter, he talks about the person, again, who is turned away from the Lord and will not come back. But he says in verse number 9, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. And so the apostle or the writer says, we're still confident in you even though we've given you these stern warnings. And how should, and the question is, how should we regard warnings given to us today? When the preacher stands in the pulpit or in the Bible class or the elder stands up and says, brethren, you know, we need to be faithful to God. If we're not faithful to God, then we lose everything that we're hoping for. Does that mean then that we're saying you're not faithful to God? No, it doesn't mean that, does it? So how should we regard warnings, even stern warnings, when they're given today? What should we do with those? How should we regard them? Heed the warnings, says Carol. Carol says, heed them. And that's the idea. That's why warnings are given. Warnings do not necessarily say that you're doing something wrong. Warnings are just that. They're warnings. When you come to a sharp curve, you're driving in the mountains, and it says danger, sharp curve ahead. That doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It's a warning to prepare for what's about to come. And so a warning is just that. It's a warning, and it does not say that something is wrong necessarily with you, but you must heed the warning, right? All right, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to look into chapter 11. And this is where we get the encouragement from examples of faith. In chapter 11, and the entire chapter is really about one thing. It's about examples of people in the past under the Old Testament law, it's referring back to the Old Testament, about people who were faithful to God. It's not talking about people who were super saints. It's talking about ordinary people who through faith in God were able to accomplish significant things. Uh, these were people who did not go off into unbelief. Now, a lot of the people in the Old Testament went into unbelief. The Israelites themselves had numerous problems. But here we find people that accomplished and overcame this world by means of their faith. Sometimes Hebrews chapter 11 is called the honor roll of faith in that it lists so many great Old Testament worthies who demonstrated what they could accomplish by faith. Now, there are a number of ways to approach Hebrews chapter 11. I've heard preachers stand up and preach, well, uh, if you say you can't, can't uh, stand up against the wickedness of this world, on the judgment day, verse 7, Hebrews eleven seven, 7, Noah, Noah will stand up and condemn you. And they go through a long list of things here. Uh, you can't resist sin. Well, Moses will stand up and condemn you on the day of judgment because Moses resisted. I think that's, uh, while that, I guess there's an element of truth in that. I don't think that's how we should approach Hebrews chapter 11, that it's about how we're going to be condemned if we do wrong. That's not the point. Is it true? Yeah, it may be true, but that's not the point. The point of this chapter is that we are 
encouraged. Notice the word there, encouragement. We're encouraged from these examples of faith. And these examples of faith say to us, Moses says to us, Noah says to us, Abraham, David, they all say to us, you can, you can be successful. You can faithfully serve God. You can overcome. You can please God. I did it and so can you. And I get the picture here and maybe someone told me recently this was a wrong picture. I don't know. Uh, but I get the picture here of runners in a race. And they have a stadium full of people who've already completed the race. And what are the people in the stadium do, doing? Are they pointing the finger and condemning you? Or are they cheering you on? I think they're cheering you on. Now someone says, well, that's not really right to say it that way. Well, maybe you're right. I don't know. I got this from Hebrews chapter 12. In chapter 12, therefore, this is 12.1, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses are those in chapter 11, and it says we're surrounded by all of these. That's why I got the illustration of a stadium. Maybe that's wrong. But we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's where I get this idea of running a race inside a stadium. Uh, I, this is another thing that makes me think Paul is the author of Hebrews. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he talked about the runners in a race. He uses a similar illustration here. And all these witnesses who are encouraging us, uh, that's what I see in this. So I want you to look at chapter 11 as a chapter of encouragement, okay? And I think if you're not encouraged by this chapter, you may not be reading it correctly. Now, in verse 1, he uses a couple of terms to describe what faith is. What is he what does he say about faith there? Faith is what? Substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And uh, give me an example of evidence of things not seen that you believe in. Something you've not seen but you believe in. How about heaven? How about heaven? We believe in heaven. Why do we believe in heaven? Well, because someone came down from heaven, that's Jesus. He lived among men. He taught us about heaven, that it's a place where we can go. And then he died for our sins so we can be forgiven in order that we can go to heaven. We've never seen heaven, but the resurrection of Jesus proves the existence of heaven because it proves that Jesus is the Son of God. It proves that everything he ever said is true. And so we have evidence of things not seen, heaven, you've not seen it, neither have I. But we have evidence of its existence because of Jesus. And so that's, faith is based upon evidence. Sometimes people say, well, you know, you people who are Christians, you just got blind faith, you just believe in something, you have no idea whether it's true or not. I remember when uh, Evander Holyfield was on... Uh, ABC, Good Morning America, and Charlie Gibson was interviewing him. And Evander Holyfield is a, was a man of faith. And uh, Holyfield was talking about why he believed in God and so on. And Charlie Gibson said, well, yeah, that's a matter of uh, you've got faith, but remember what faith is. Faith is believing without evidence. Faith is believing when you have no proof that it's true. That's what faith is not. Faith is based on evidence. We have evidence, and we consider the evidence. We say, this appears to be correct, and based on the evidence, I conclude then that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Heaven is real, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have faith. Now, this is the faith chapter, and faith always does something. What does faith always do? I'm talking about Bible faith as it is portrayed in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith, I want one more word after that. Two words, faith, faith is my noun. I need a verb. 
Someone hold up your hand because I, I see some of you answering. What is faith? What does it do, Lynette? It gives us hope. That's true. Faith gives us hope. Is that what you said? Yeah. Faith gives us hope, but I'm, I'm looking for one word. Well, faith and believing are the same. Yes, sir. Acts or obeys. Either one of those word, words will fit. Faith acts. Faith obeys. And here's what I want you to see. Just look through this quickly, and we're almost out of time. I want you to look at uh, verse 4. Here's the first one mentioned. It's Abel. By faith, Abel offered. Okay? There's your action word. There's your verb. Faith, Abel offered. Uh, Enoch, who walked with God, pleased God. Uh, Noah, it talks about what Noah did. Noah prepared. Look at verse number 8. Abraham obeyed. Uh, drop down a little bit further all the way to uh, the parents of Moses. In verse 23. Uh, verse 23, by faith Moses. And it's talking really about what his parents did. They hid this child, okay? Uh, Moses himself. In verse number 27, by faith he forsook Egypt. By faith he kept the Passover. Faith always acts. Faith always does something. And that tells you there's a problem with the doctrine of faith only, okay? Let, let's not get caught up in that because that's not what the chapter is about either. Though you may teach, a le teach lessons about salvation is not by faith only. What I want you to see is for us, not an answer to false doctrine, but for us, our faith needs to motivate us. It needs to move us. It needs to cause us to act. It needs to cause us to obey God. Well, we're going to take up with this on Wednesday night, and we're going to try to move through this entire chapter in one class. Can we do that? I said we would try. So that's Wednesday evening. Go ahead and answer all the questions on pages 16 and 17 until the end of the questions. and We'll pick this up Wednesday night. Thank you so much for participating this morning.